Praise God. Well, when Jesus uh, was ministering on the earth, one day he went to a, uh, one of his outside meetings in the synagogue and he drew huge crowds wherever he went. Huge crowds followed him. And he had a great way with words. I think I have a slide up here. Yeah. Boy, that's blurry. Uh, anyway, uh, great crowds at the synagogue. One day he was speaking to this large crowd. And he said this. You love to talk about the manna that God provided miraculously during the time of Moses. Now he offers the true bread from heaven that gives life to the world. And the crowd said, well, we want that bread. Give us that bread. And Jesus answered and said, I am the bread of life. Believe in me and you will never be hungry or thirsty again. I am the true bread from heaven. Anyway, the crowd said, well, we want this bread. Give us that bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Believe in me and you'll never be hungry or thirsty again. I am the true bread from heaven. And the crowd started grumbling and say, who does this guy think he is? He's not from heaven. We know him. He's Jesus. He's Joseph's son. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He repeats himself. If you eat of this bread, you'll never die. Here's the truth. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have eternal life. Everyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood becomes part of me and I become part of them. Well, the crowd does, did not like cannibalism talk. And hundreds of them walked away. The crowd thinned out tremendously. And all that was left was his disciples and a few others. And he turned to his disciples and what did he say? Are you going to go away too? Is this, is this too hard for you? Are you going to leave me as, like these other people did? And what did they say to him? They said, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. So this morning I want to talk to you about the body and the blood of Christ. That was a pretty powerful message that he proclaimed. But here's what Jesus does. He gets a big crowd and then he thins them out. He finds out who's really serious about becoming a disciple. By preaching the truth. He's not trying to shock them. He's trying to challenge them. He said, if you want to be my disciple, you know all those things he said, you've got to hate your mother and brother and sister, and you've got to give up everything to follow me, you've got to carry your cross to follow me. Those were hard things for them to swallow in those days. So Jesus, like I say, is not trying to, to uh, get rid of people. He's trying to thin them out. He's trying to find out who's really serious about this. And I do the same thing. I've been doing the same thing here and wherever I go, wherever I teach. I try to make sure that I'm teaching things that will make disciples. I'm not trying to entertain you. I'm not trying to make you feel good. I'm trying to encourage you to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. And Jesus made sure that he made his audience understand that he was the fulfillment of the Jewish Passover. In Exodus 12, uh, Moses was preparing to lead Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And uh, he instructed the Jews how to avoid death. The last plague, of course, was the death of the firstborn throughout the land of Egypt. And he said, if you're serious about me, says God, pretty much, you'll do this to escape death. Otherwise, you won't escape the death. Did you take a clean lamb without blemish, a perfect lamb without defect, and you kill it. And you eat the lamb. You roast and eat the lamb for strength and health on the journey ahead. You see, no one, when they left Egypt, no one was ever, no one was feeble, no one was sick when the nation of Israel left Egypt. They were all strong. They were ready for the journey because they had eaten the lamb. And then he said, take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost of your home. And when the angel of death passes through the land of Egypt, they will see the blood. And you will escape death. 
Then when Jesus was about 30 years old, his cousin John was baptizing people in the Jordan River. In John 1, verse 29, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, there is what? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus in human form with, real, with a real body and real blood. Jesus was in a physical body, had divine blood without sin. He was a lamb. He was a lamb without defect, never sinned. Then Jews could not miss John's clear example of temple sacrifice and the Passover. Later on, Jesus was preaching in John chapter 6, and he said again, I assure you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is the true food, and my blood is the true drink. All who eat my flesh and drink my blood remain in me, and I in them. Powerful message. The, the, the Gospels all tell this basic story. Now, Jesus sat down with his disciples during the Passover. Next slide, please. He sat down with them at a, at a table that's called the triclinium. This was the way the Jews would have had their Passover meal. They would have had a triclinium. They sat around a, a U-shaped table. And uh, this would have been John. Now, this is what the theologians believe, and historically, this is maybe the way it would have been. This would have been John, and this would have been Peter over here. They were charged with making sure if anybody came into the room with, with bad intent that they would protect the host. And Jesus being the host here, and then Judas. I'm not sure which one of these is supposed to be Judas, but Judas would have been to his left. And then the rest of the disciples scattered out. But that's, that's basically what the, what the theologians believe. This is what, the, the, uh, what Jesus called the Last Supper. But it wasn't the Last Supper, was it? He said, I've got another supper coming. I've got one coming in heaven, and you're going to be there with me for it. So he ate the Passover with his disciples prior to his crucifixion. And during that time, he said these words in Luke 22. He took a loaf of bread, and when he had thanked God for it, he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this, is the, this wine is the token of God's new covenant to save you. An agreement sealed with the blood I will pour out for you. There's the body and the blood. And when we eat the bread, we remember his body, a pure spotless lamb without sin for strength and health. When we drink the juice... We remember that his blood was poured out to wash away the sin of everyone who would receive him. And it would protect them from death, from the death penalty of sin. So Jesus completely fills, fulfills the Passover. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. So his body, the flesh of the lamb of God. John 6, 48. Now you can go there. Jesus, again, I want to keep reiterating it. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. However, the bread from heaven gives eternal life to everyone who eats it. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will what? Live forever. This bread is my flesh offered so the world may Live the bread of life. Jesus, sent by God, is the source of supernatural, eternal, physical life. You realize you will be in the New Jerusalem physically. You'll have a new body. But you'll be there physically with Jesus. Bread is considered a necessary staple for life. It sells out quickly when a hurricane is coming. We eat the nourishment of Christ by believing in him, trusting in him, receiving him as, his, as our savior. He gives us strength for the journey ahead, this life journey. How many of you know you need strength to live this life? Yeah. You need strength. He gives us the strength we need. 
He gives us physical health that transcends what we would be experiencing without him. We're healthier. You may think you're not healthy now, but you're healthier now than you would be without Christ. The bread comes from heaven, sent by God the Father himself. Heavenly bread. It's wonder bread. Earthly bread has to be eaten every day. Religious bread is this. Get baptized, join the church, do good works, and hope you make it to heaven. That's religious bread. Heavenly bread, the bread of life, is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now the virgin birth guaranteed the perfect quality of this bread from heaven. Have you ever heard someone say of a pregnant woman, she's got a bun in the oven? Right? Well, Jesus had a, uh, Mary had a bun in the oven. Miraculously conceived by the Holy Spirit. Free from the stain of original sin. Perfect. And he came out of the oven perfect. Then he said, if you eat the bread, you'll live forever. You will receive eternal life. And that, because the Lamb of God died to pay sin's penalty... Those who receive him will escape sin's death penalty. Eternal death. Natural bread isn't eternal. Jesus, the bread of life, is eternal. It won't get moldy. His bread doesn't get moldy. This bread, oh, I had a piece of moldy bread the other day. Accidentally put it on a sandwich. Spotted it when I was about to take a bite. Hallelujah. I didn't take a bite. But Jesus... That bread will never get moldy, will never get old, will never fade away. That bread gives us the strength we need to live this life, as I said before. Now, his blood, then, is the shed blood of the Lamb of God. All throughout the Bible, 427 times, God speaks of blood in relation to his work, as part of his work. Here are some examples. Leviticus 17.11. The life of any creature is where? The life is in its blood. I have given you the blood so you can make atonement for your sins. It is the blood representing life that brings you atonement, forgiveness. Hebrews 9.22 Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26, verse 28. Jesus said, This is my blood which seals the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out to forgive the sins of many. Colossians 1.14 God has purchased our freedom with his blood and has forgiven some of our sins. Forgiven what? All of our sins. From the Passover perspective, Receiving his blood payment, when we receive his blood payment, is like painting his blood on the doorpost of our heart. It's an internal thing. That's why he says you need to drink it. It needs to become an internal thing. And that blood saves us from the death penalty of sin. Death cannot touch us. The grave cannot hold us. The blood cleanses us of sin. 1 John 1, 7. We're living in the light of God's presence just as Christ is and then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from every sin. We are made clean. If you're born again, you are clean. But you don't know what I did this morning. I, God, I, know what you, maybe, I don't know what you did this morning, but all I know is no matter what it was, you're clean. You're clean. It cleanses us. Because it's perfect. It's not stained by original sin. It cleanses us because it's pure. It's not polluted. It's not decaying. It cleanses us from past sins, present sins, and future sins. It cleanses us from all sins. We don't have to sacrifice Jesus again. Hello? We have been cleansed once for all time. When we receive him, we receive his body and blood sacrificed for us. Here's an interesting commentary I ran across. In remembering Christ, as, as in the communion meal, what we call the communion meal, we didn't we drink juice instead of fermented wine because fermentation is a decaying process. 
The blood of Christ does not decay. We're born with the poison of sin in us until we receive Christ and then his blood washes our blood free of poison. His blood is eternal. We don't have to keep drinking his blood to attain salvation or to keep our salvation. We don't have to keep drinking. It's a one time. He died once for all time. And when we're cleansed and forgiven, it's a permanent, eternal effect. Our sins are washed away. They're not just covered. Hello? That's what they did in the Testament. They, the, the blood of, of the sacrificed animals covered their sin, did not wash them away. But Jesus' blood washes the sin away. They'll never again be connected. I've told you this before, but the, the word remember. God does not remember our sins. The word remember is made up of two parts, right? Re, which means do again, and member, which means join to. So God will never join us to our sin again. We are totally separated from our sin for eternity once we're born again. He will not remember. He will not reconnect our sins to us. 1 Peter 1.19 He paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. The perfect sacrifice. Precious means valuable and enduring. It will last for all eternity and will never lose its value. His blood is powerful. Revelation 12.11 and they, the saints of God, the believers, have defeated him. Who is him? Satan. The devil. Have defeated him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of their testimony. And they were not afraid to die. Were protected by the blood of Christ from eternal death, from the power of sin, from the temptation of the world, the flesh, and the devil. From the lake of fire. All by the blood of Christ. In God's courtroom, <clears throat> the devil <clears throat> is the accuser. And Jesus is our attorney. My plea for mercy can't be based on my good works, my good looks, my good attitude, my good intention, anything I think about myself as being good will not earn me mercy from God. The only plea I have is the blood of Christ. And then I receive grace and I receive mercy from the righteous judge. And so does everyone who is born again. Every time you are accused by the devil, you say, I am protected by the blood of Christ. Father, I know that we have Christ in us as believers. I know you're there in each one of us. But Lord, we need to have a deeper realization of that presence in our lives. We need to recognize that truly the glory of God resides in every believer. Lord God, we give you praise for your goodness. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I pray you'll help each one of us grasp the fullness of what it means to have Christ in us, in all of His majesty, in all of His beauty, in all of His glory. So when we were born again, Lord, we truly did eat of Your flesh. We drank Your blood figuratively so that we would become one with You and You would become one with us. We thank You that we celebrate we celebrate you today, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen.